Okay, this good. meeting is being recorded. Okay, so so the, the the point of this is this is the first time we've done um, um, a pre pre recorded courses, and I guess the point, and I was trying to figure this out. <laughs> I guess the point is that that way people can watch them at their leisure, and then the and then the workshops will schedule separately and those will be live um, and presumably this will <laughs> allow us uh, to give people the flexibility so that we'll cover a larger portion of the globe you know because if you're in Melbourne or wherever um, it's hard to work entirely off of New York time so so Kimberly and I thought we would offer a, a second version of our workshop course, and we decided that we would call it Kinds of Love for reasons that I kind of remember. I managed to convince her that was a really good idea um, because it seemed to follow for me out of um, the first workshop and some other things that we'd been thinking um and so then when we sat down to begin the the hard part which is how do you organize and um such a course and what would a syllabus look like um we both kind of just stopped in our tracks and realized that it was going to be really hard um, to, to have a course called Kinds of Love, which, you know, and the prelude for all this is that we're working in the, we're working in the tradition of, um, oh, in the historical perspective, we're working in the tradition of European romanticism. Um, but the most recent um, embodiments of that who've been, uh, been influential on both of us are, are, are Jung and Hillman and Henri Corbin, all of whom I think are arguably um, uh, in the broadly speaking romantic tradition. So the first thing we have to explain to people who have who are new to what we're doing is that we take the imagination to be utterly central to everything and one of the <laughs> one of the real hurdles that people have to come to terms with at some point is that in order to do that to the degree that we're suggesting, you pretty much have to deconstruct your entire world, <laughs> including yourself. Um, and this is difficult. Um, but the, our contention is that only by doing that are you able to occupy a place both psychologically and physiologically, which has sufficient freedom and scope to really engage with the material we're going to try to present. So, so okay, so I sat down and I thought, kinds of love because Kimberly kind of threw it back at me after we after we came up with absolutely nothing and she said at least as I remember it she said you you try it and see if you can do it and all hell broke loose um <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to walk you through the kinds of um um the kinds of problems that arose and the um, it was actually uh, it was actually kind of an intense psychological experience because I sat down and I thought, okay, kinds of love, how are we going to do that? And I thought, well, you we need to talk about the thought of the heart, which is which is an idea that comes from both Hillman and Corbin. Um, 
because Henri Corbin said the heart is the organ of the imagination. And so the thought of the heart in Hillman's version of it, the thought of the heart is the imagination. And so you have to, in, 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 in that way of saying it, you've got the heart doing a kind of thinking. Um, and so it's a kind of, it's not an irrational heart, it's a rational heart, um, but it is a heart. And that's what the imagination does. It thinks through the heart. So, okay, kinds of love. What would you do with that? And I, I thought immediately, because it's in the back of my mind, that Hillman once wrote a book called Kinds of Power, which I thought was, you know, a beautiful book in which he deconstructed all the ideas of power. And he had a chapter on each one. And I thought, well, that's a, that's a good thing that we should do with love. And then, and then I thought, well, well, wait, so, so what do you have? How do I think about kinds of love? And I'm thinking of Corbin and Hillman. And so I thought, well, for Corbin, the primary relationship is, is between a human soul and its celestial counterpart who is the angel of that soul. And that's the primary, um, that's the primary personal relationship, which is the relation between the earthly and the divine, on which hangs all of creation for, for Corbin. One of the, virtues, but one of the difficulties of Corbin's vision of the world is that it is theological. He is a mystic and a theologian. And whether you yourself are a believer in God or not, that's not really the point. Corbin doesn't talk about God very much because for Corbin, God's just too far away to matter. <laughs> um, but what you do get in Corbin is angels. And every being of light has an angel. And that means that every being is in some sense personal. And he means, he means pretty much every being, except for demons, which we won't talk about now at any rate. Every, and even the demons are personal. So, so for, for Corban, every relationship is personal, um, properly personal. That is, there are no objects. There are only persons. And so I thought, well, okay, kinds of love. So there are, is, there are how many kinds of love? Well, you need to, first of all, personify the whole world. So you have to lay that out for people. And that's often a, a heck of a, a lift. I mean, that's hard because that means you have to convince people that there aren't any objects. There's only subjects, except they're not subjects because if there's no objects, there aren't any subjects. So what you, have, because that, those two come as a pair. So you have to sort of convince people that the whole world is an animate, animated cosmos with, with personal presences everywhere, and then that if it, then then that's a huge that's a, that's a huge jump for people to make. And I thought, well, okay, but that's that's like that's got to happen first before you can even begin to talk about kinds of love, because what would the kinds of love, um, what would be what's the what's the operative variable here if i'm generating kinds of love say i'm god <laughs> and i've just made the entire universe and because i'm infinite um 
and I'm a loving being, there are going to be an infinite or at least very large number of kinds of love. But based on what? what what's the what's the variable here? If love is the subject, then what's the variable? And I thought, well, I guess kinds of beings, kinds of persons. But then I thought, well, that gets complicated really fast because I'm not sure what, what kinds of persons there are. There must be lots of kinds of persons, but what's the, what, what's the operative variable there? Is it just more personhood or less personhood or are there different kinds of um, beings out there and then how are they related what kinds of relation are we talking about is it is it mirroring is it correspondence you know, what are the relationships based on what kind of connections and i and this all this all happened in about you know three or four minutes and then i realized okay there's a there are two poles here let's 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 pull back on all those complications that seem they might enter into the question of what are the kinds of love. There, there's a variable, I suppose, about what kinds of person you're related to. Are you relating to the personhood of a flower or the personhood of your spouse or the personhood of your favorite pen? You know, I mean, and, and, and what, you know, so I thought, okay. And then there's, then there's the then there's the relation, the nature of the relation there. And I thought, I had an intuition that, well, the nature of the relation is between you and whatever this other being that you may or may not love in one of whatever number of ways there might be, um, it's got to depend on the context, which means it depends on the nature of the world that is made by the relationship between the two of you. And then I realized, oh, well then, but wait, that means you have to have many kinds of worlds in order for there to be many kinds of love. And I thought, well, this is getting out of hand. So I thought, okay, let's go back to square one. And you've got these two beings who might or might not be in some sort of loving relationship of one sort or another. And they can't be objects. They have to be, well, they can't be subjects because subjects and objects go together. Objects are outside and objective and subjects are inside and subjective. And we have to get rid of that. And that's a heavy lift. This is all, but while I'm trying to think, well, what's the first thing I put on the syllabus, you know? And I've already, I'm halfway through deconstructing all of reality here. And then I thought, well, okay, so there's the two poles of this relationship and neither, they both have to be persons, neither can be a thing. And in Corbin and Hillman's, from, from in, in, in their world, the difference is, between the, the pertinent difference here is between an idol, which is a fixed kind of being, and an icon, which is not fixed. An icon you see through to the mystery which lies behind it. So I thought, oh, right, that's what you have to begin with, is you have these two beings in some relationship as yet to be specified which is going to determine what kind of love relationship they might have and both of them have to be see-through <laughs> they can't be fixed because otherwise it would be idolatry and not love and so then i thought Ah, in the technical terminology of Corbin, the theologian, the term for that mysterious openness to mystery has to do with what in the medieval age was called apophatic theology. Cataphatic theology is the theology about things you can say about God. Uh, <laughs> and there aren't all that many, um, but, well, you can't even say he's a he, though people often do, but you could say, well, 
it's personal, it's infinite, it's omniscient, it's omnipotent, and pretty soon you run out of stuff you can say about God, most of which you see was negative. And then for Corbin, the interesting part happens because it's the things you can't say about God that are the ones where the mystery lies. And so it's that mysterious presence of the divine that we begin to be able to experience down here when the imagination is working, which gets us back to what we're supposed to be talking about here. But I'm still in the middle of trying to think, well, what about kinds of love? And I've come to the conclusion that you've got these two beings who are going to exhibit one of the multiple kinds of love. And I've just decided that you have to in order to understand that, you have to establish the rules of an apophatic psychology rather than an apophatic theology. Well, that right there is a, is a you know a hundred year job or at least a couple of dissertations, and I'm not going to get it done in the first week of the syllabus. But okay, so that's a problem. And then I was then I thought. Well, it's not so much the two things, the two beings, but it's what's going on between them. That's maybe since they just disappeared into their apophatic mystery, um, that's going to be hard to get a handle on. So maybe we should more focus on what happens between the two beings. And that reminded me of the French feminist philosopher, Luce Irigaray, who says, Oh, what's most important here is the between us when you're when you're dealing with a love relationship of any sort between you and a flower, between you and your pen, between you and your spouse, whatever, that it's the between us which is most important. And she says that gets you to the idea of the breath. And there's a long pause here where I connect back to um, a philosopher who we will read a little bit of in this course, um, Emmanuel Kocha, who says, well, in order to really understand the breath, you have to understand, you have to have a metaphysics um, in which um, the, the entire world is composed of beings who share a connection such that um, um, everything is in everything. So I'm thinking, all right, in order to get to the between us, we need to be conspiring together, breathing together, and we need, in order to have a sense of the surround that we are in, that helps provide the context for our relationship because relationships don't occur in a vacuum. They occur in a world. Here they occur in a world of breathing beings. So at this point, and all this is happening in about five minutes, I, my head is spinning and I realize, oh, oh, what that means is that each pair of beings in this potential love relationship are in a world that they share. And so we have to pluralize the idea of world before we start to talk about kinds of love, because it might be true <laughs> that every kind of love requires its own kind of context, its own sense of um, worldliness. And then I start to think, oh, in order to 
we're already way beyond subjects and objects, or at least we think we are. But if we're really going to do this right, I, we would have to explain to people that when you give up subjects and objects in order to get an apophatic psychology of two mysterious beings in communion, being in one of the many as yet to be determined kinds of love, um, you've really got to get rid of space and time as we know it. And that's a, that's, a, that, that's a hot topic for me. I've been trying to get to this for a long time. Because if you don't have subjects and objects, then you don't have um, Newtonian Cartesian space or Newtonian and Cartesian time. You need to pluralize and complicate the idea of time. Now, handily for me, since my background in the last 20 years is a long study of Henri Corbin, my breath was suddenly taken away be again because I realized, well, that's the point. That's why he does this. Corbin, very early in his, in his work, establishes the fact, <laughs> for him a fact, that linear time is incredibly destructive <laughs> of personhood. And he says, no, no, you have to have something like cyclical time and a pluralization of time. Because if you only have linear time, he's saying, in effect, you'll end up with subjects and objects. And that goes wrong really quickly. And then you lose personhood and you lose the possibility of apophatic psychology. So, okay. So before we even start, and now I begin to see why this happened it must have happened to Corbin in a, a few blinding moments. He realizes you got to get rid of space as a three-dimensional construct, and you've got to get rid of time. Um, or you have to pluralize them so that you can occupy. And here, this gets exciting. If there's not just one objective kind of time and not just one objective kind of space, then you maybe have the opportunity to realize that there are multiples. That, that opens things up a little bit. Um, but wait, <laughs> if those go, then what happens to matter? What happens to stuff? What happens to substance? Uh, that becomes mutable too. That has um, a variety of potential forms. And how would that manifest in an individual human life? Well, your perception of the world would change, wouldn't it, if space and time suddenly changed for you. Substances and things would come along with them in their, in their changeable flow and mutability. So then I think, oh, well, another thing we've got to look at is the, is the variety, not just of spaces and times and material, um, sensations and substances, we need to look at perception being variable. And for me, that perception is always really closely associated with feelings and emotions. And at that point, I'm thinking, okay, now we're back in, now we're back in reality, because what is love but a feeling or an emotion? And then I'm stunned to discover that if you look up the, um, the, the academic study of emotions, love doesn't figure very strongly in most of them. I've seen lists where nobody mentions love at all. They say happiness, maybe. 
um, and anger, but there's a number. And I thought, well, that's very strange. And maybe it suggests that these people haven't opened up their, their hima, the thought of their heart enough. And they're being too much influenced by the idea of subjects and objects being in relationship. And so I'm thinking, well, maybe we're actually onto something here. So then I thought, well, one thing to do would be to look at the, hist in order to indicate to people that this isn't all completely crazy and to show that there has been over historical time and history is a perfectly decent um, uh, academic discipline and no one can argue with that, but look at the historical development of ideas of space, experiences of time. How about the history of emotions? How about the history of perception? How about the history of what it means to be an ego or a subject? And thankfully for me, these are all really um, hot topics <laughs> in academia in the last decades, which wasn't the case when I was going to college. But you can now find tremendous amounts of thought and writing about the history of the self, the history of emotions, the history of sensation, the changes in the idea of space and time and matter over historical spans and then geographically, culturally. And I thought, well, isn't that, isn't that, oh, that's pretty harsh. At the end of my little three or five or 10 minutes that we're in this all happened to me and it was very disorienting. I realized in order, and maybe I'm wrong, but in, I thought, it, no, I didn't just think, I knew <laughs> that in order to get at the root of what one might mean by kinds of love, you had to deconstruct all of these things. And then taking Henri Corbin very seriously, he says in his book on Avicenna that towards the end of his life, Avicenna realized, and I, I'm paraphrasing, that all the constructions of his mind that he thought were objective um, depictions of reality were really just a reflection of his own soul and that this wasn't a problem. It's in fact what happens to everybody that at some point they realize that all that they thought was objective is a reflection of their soul and that that's an, that's, that's an advance. I suddenly realized that my 10 minutes of deconstruction were deconstructing me because the point of the matter personally was how on earth can I even begin to think about what the kinds of love are until I deconstruct what I think love is and that that process is what this course might be able to reveal to those who participate in it, including me. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, for, for two or three days, I was almost um, inarticulate because I was sort of coming down from these multiple realizations that in, and let's see if I can put it in a little nutshell. In order to free up my heart and other people's, in order to help other people free up their hearts, there's really 
you got to let go of pretty much everything in the way in which I, at least, like to hang on to things, you know? And it doesn't mean that they disappear. And it doesn't mean that it's freedom and relativity. It's, it amounts to kind of shutting up and watching <laughs> to see what happens <laughs> and, and to see how the world presents itself to you and going in to that phenomenology of the world with a predisposition to allow perception, emotion, um, and all your preconceptions about what the world is and how it presents itself to flow. And that that kind of, I suppose, flow state isn't a bad way to talk about it, is a precondition for then being sensitive enough and having a, an activated thought of the heart um, to be sensitive enough with your heart to maybe be able to establish the proper or adequate or possible criteria to judge what counts as kinds of love. And so, and Kimberly hasn't seen this yet, we're still working on it, but at the moment, and it may change, <laughs> the syllabus begins with this lecture or one like it, um, and then there's a section called Decolonizing the Universe. Then there's a section on the history um, and cultural variability of perception. And then there's a section on the nature and variability of emotions. And then there's a section on the plurality of spaces. And then there's a section on time. And then there's a section on matter and its changing potentials. And at the end of this course on kinds of love, we might be able to start. What do, you, what do you think, Kimberly? Does that make any sense? We're making this up as we go along. Yeah, I know. Um, I thought that was incredible. I love that. Does that? Yeah. Is that? Yeah. A, is that a course? I have. I have. Of course, I always have more. But here, here's the thing for for okay. people for for because yeah. So let's assume that we have some um, unreconstructed um, Cartesians in our class. And okay. I have plenty of unreconstructed Cartesian in, in, the, in me. Mm. He's, he's a little guy who's he's very sad these days because he's, he's almost on the verge of being entirely deconstructed. But every once in a while, he pops up and he wants to throw rocks and, and whatnot and, and, claim, and claim fundamental reality back. <laughs> and he's so he's a sort of a scientist so even the scientists have gone completely bonkers lately and there is um i'm referencing an article in quanta magazine in 2013 so it goes back a few years and since they published this the science has gotten even weirder but if you want to if if you if you want if you need as i used to for years if you need 
um, um, validation from honest to God scientists for deconstructing time and space, you can find that in quantum and, mechanics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so there's these guys, Arkani, Hamed, and Trinka. Um, they were mathematicians and physicists, and they were messing around with particle physics and quantum dynamics and whatnot. And I used to be really, really allergic to making um, uh, analogies between quantum physics and anything else, but I, my allergy seems to have cured, cured itself. And in order to simplify their life as particle physics physicists in the world of quantum mechanics they discovered the existence of a of a geometrical object in higher dimensional spaces called the amplitudehedron and um they proposed well, they didn't propose because in mathematics one doesn't, one discovers. There is a master amplitudehedron with an infinite number of facets, um, which in theory represents the total of all physical processes in the universe, okay, um, which makes calculations easier, but also, in the, in the process of discovering the utility of this infinite object to describe reality, they discovered that the variables of time and space disappeared. Hmm. They're not necessary. So they said, in a sense, we would see that change arises from the structure of the object, but it's not from the object changing. The object is basically timeless. So giving up space and time as fundamental constituents of nature and figuring out how the Big Bang and all the evolution of everything in it arose out of pure geometry if they can do that, then we can do this. <laughs> yeah? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so they so they give us they, they give us some um, nod. We can we can make we can make these things work. Yes. So now if it's necessary or important we could talk a little bit about a little more about the organ of imagination and a little yeah. bit more about psychocosmology because that's, that's what the reading will be. Yep. Should we do that? Yeah. Do you want to do you want to interject know. something? <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. 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 So see, <laughs> so so it's sort of Oh, I'm, I'm reminded of and this is this is terrible. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of Muhammad Ali. You know, he had the rope a dope strategy. You just let you just let yourself get pummeled. So everybody's been sitting there letting themselves get pummeled, um, <laughs> and now hopefully you're 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 malleable enough in the mm. sense in the sense that you've seen the the uh, my argument is that in order to make this work for you, you have to be, um, you have to be in a state of, uh, well, think of it as fiction. Think, think of the entire course as poetic and literary, theatrical, whatever form of the arts you want to approach this with you know you're supposed to what is it um, suspension of disbelief mm -hmm. in order to get in in order to get into this material with Hellman and Corbin and Jung though Jung always kept one hand out here grabbing onto science mm -hmm. um, uh, Hellman and Corbin they don't care they don't care about that in order to defang 
your fundamentalist um, Cartesian modernist um, um, person in you, just just um, just pretend it's poetry and literature from which you're never going to return. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you can begin to take this material seriously, but not literally. One of the, one of the tricks, which if you, if you play it on yourself long enough, becomes habitual, and then eventually it takes over your whole life, which is what I'm suggesting you let it do, um, mm -hmm. is never to take anything too literally. So, Corbin's, I've kind of already sketched out this world of imagination. Corbin refers to the cosmology, theology uh, that he's proposing as a psychocosmology. And that's a very handy word because it elides the psychological and the mm -hmm. cosmological. And to, to put it really starkly, and I always had, I had a lot, a lot of trouble with this for a long time, and now I think I'm okay with it. Corbin says, there is no pure physics. There's only the physics of a given psychological spiritual formation. So if you're, if you're doing pure physics, it's because you're in a pure physical world. Now, it just so happens that we mostly share that with other people, and it is a world of constraints, and it is <laughs> also true that the world of imagination, where you don't think, take things literally, is also full of constraints. But the nature of your experience of the constraints is, is different. And Hillman would say, well, you know, literalizing is itself a mode of imagination. And we need to literalize. It's not really possible to live without literalizing something, if only because we get too frightened. <laughs> um, but that's fine. So Corbin says, there is no pure physics. There's only the physics of a given psychic state or spiritual stage. And okay, so we'll live with that. And he's, it, with the notion of psychocosmology, he's, 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 he's introduced a term that once you accept it means you can no longer speak of subjects and objects. There is strictly speaking no psychology in the old sense. And Jung was absolutely trying to get to this. Um, and, and Hillman is absolutely trying to get to this. When Jung talks about um, um, the psychoid late in his work, after all that work on alchemy, um, and, and it's all that work on alchemy that, 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 that reinforces his sense that, oh, wow, it's really hard to make a distinction between inner and outer, between matter and psyche. In fact, I can't, he says. That's what this alchemy stuff is about. From another point of view, Hillman, sort of late in his life, he just can't, he can't do psychology in an armchair anymore. He's got to do psychology in the world and talk about the psychic reality of, of buildings and cities and things because in my reading of Hillman, he thinks, you know, too much, too much of that inner, inner psychological stuff that needs to get out. Corbin's already out there. He's already got his apophatic psychology. 
And once you have an apophatic psychology, you, you realize, well, it's not really psychology in the old sense. It's a new, I don't know, it's a cosmo psychology, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, because it, I mean, and another way of thinking of this, which might make it um, more accessible to people who struggle with it, and I was one of them for 30 odd years, um, is to think of it as a kind of return to what we used to think of in the old days as primitive psychology before Western European rationalism discovered the truth. There were plenty of people all over the world who thought that the world was full of spirits and persons and personified presences. And when Jung did his descent into darkness, he discovered that, oh, well, my word, there they are. <laughs> and Hillman's very much trying to resuscitate that. And so is Corbin. So in one sense, they're not proposing anything new. They're proposing something super old. It sort of comes with the territory of being human and that a handful of cultures in Western Europe decided to jettison a few hundred years ago um, with mixed results. So the idea then would be, ah, was it Stanley Diamond says somewhere, um, um, Oh, I'm not going to remember how he how he says it. Uh, it it's not that you want to um, discard the primitive, the primitive, as he called it, because he was decades ago. You don't want to overcome the primitive. You want to integrate it before you go beyond it, so that whatever kinds of animism we may be able to resuscitate by thinking about the kinds of love will be new. There'll be a, there'll be a modern or postmodern or at least contemporary interpretation of this fluid world. And from Corbin's point of view, one more point about psychocosmology and how it relates to imagination. Imagination in one sense is all there is. And here I take Corbin's, one of his favorite creation myths from Ibn Arabi, the great mystic, um, who says, in the beginning, God was lonely all by himself. And this is a Sufi um, creation myth, or at least a mystical creation myth. And, and God was sad. And he said, I'm lonely, and I need creatures to love me and to love in return. And that's why he created the world he created it out of his primordial sadness and as he it created that world and Corbin points out the feminine quality of this creation he did it by breathing out the breath of the compassionate into a primordial existentiating cloud and that cloud is the absolute unconditioned imagination out of which all the rest of reality descends and then reascends on the intake. <laughs> so that is the breath of, compa of compassion breathes out and then inhales. And so we're all part of that, um, that um, cosmic respiration. And you don't have to take that literally. In fact, if you do, all hell will break loose. But if that's the kind of creation myth that hovers in your imagination, then you'll be in a position 
as were the romantic poets, Goethe and Wordsworth and Coleridge. This is, this is what Coleridge means by the imagination, by the way. So, so what Corban is, is getting from, from the Islamic mystics that he studied um, is mirrored very closely by a lot of the ideas of the European romantics. And if, if that's your if that's your starting place, then all this material that we're going to go through really makes sense. And that is to say, all this material we're going through will be able to enliven your senses because you have to be receptive to it. And I'm going to take a sword one more time to the little rationalist philosopher who still lives in me. And I'm going to remind him of, of Richard Rorty's great quote. Mm -hmm. Richard Rorty was an American pragmatist philosopher. And in a posthumously published book, he said, the quarrel that philosophy has with poetry is that the philosophers are afraid that it's imagination all the way down. <laughs> and it <Love> is. It. <laughs> and it is. And, mm. he, and he said as much. He said, oh, it is. Everything that occurs in your mind is a product of the poetic imagination. Mm. And that's where Hillman starts and that's where we will start bang bam <laughs> how's that, was, that that was amazing was that okay i love it all of it yep that was and so great that was so you, great well don't that really don't, we'll have to cut cut this bef before you do all the praising <laughs> 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 or we just let it we can just yeah. let it rip and let them know who we are um do you yeah. do you have questions do they have questions does anybody want to ask questions yeah. here comes a question oh no it's just a comment it says so so thrilling and gorgeous well yeah you shouldn't tell me things like that you know <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's good for me <laughs> <laughs> It's that was been, really exciting, but, but, Tom. But yeah, yeah. So, so. No, I, I, I mean, yeah. And what I is have, this, this decolonizing the universe bit? Oh, <laughs> wait, wait till you! I'm so excited. I mean, that's I'm gonna so be fun. Excited to have you read these things. Mm. I got, I've got a little too much there. I got to cut a few things out. Um, but I am so excited to have you and and the students. We just we have to get some. Yes, um, we but do. assuming assuming we get some, I, maybe we should send Nina out with a little board. You know, <laughs> she can stand on the street and and you might want to ask her. She's right there. Yeah. You could. She said <laughs> okay. She, she said, said okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, great. Need, yeah, because <laughs> we need you know I mean we need a handful of people in order to do this. But I have. I, we'll I get our been, marketing together. It's okay. Yeah, we'll get our marketing we'll together. Yeah, yeah, uh, um, yeah. So, so good. We, we can cut. We can cut. I'm going to stop or, the or, recording. Or not. Yeah, we can yeah. cut that whenever, whenever. Okay, we want. stop.